So we have a, a panel of experts here, and all of them prepare like short talks, and we'll first go through them that will introduce the people and everything. And then afterwards, we open the floor for questions from you guys. So it is really like hopefully question driven afterwards. But let's start with the short presentations, and then we'll see how it goes. Okay, here we go. Yuni, can you advance our slides? Uh, so, shall we start? Yes. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel about uh, machine learning guided optimization in LVM. Uh, as many of you may may know, we have been pushing machine learning guided optimization, or ML Go in short, at Google for a few year, years. Currently, we have the inline full size model deployed at uh, Future Chrome and some internal size sensitive binary race. On the performance optimization side, we deployed the register allocation model at a few internal large scale data center applications, including Google search. So every time you visit google.com and type in a search query, the back end and in infrastructure backing your request is compiled with the machine learning model that increases the service's capacity by about 1%. Okay, so next. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Peter. Uh, I work on Fuchsia Toolchain team and over the last Two years, I've been working together with, uh, with Mircha and Yundi on trying to productionize uh, the ML techniques, uh, in particular inlining for size, because uh, binary size is something that we care about a lot. Um, and I thought it might be helpful to share some of the lessons that we've learned uh, throughout this project. Uh, so I've listed them on a the slide. Like the first one may be obvious, but it wasn't obvious to us in the beginning, is machine learning is not a magical silver bullet. Just by turning it on, it's not gonna make your binaries smaller. Uh, it often requires additional effort. Actually, when we started, when we first managed to train the model, apply it to Fuchsia, we didn't see size decrease, we saw size increase, and it took us some time to actually understand why, what is going on, how do we need to adjust the training process, how we need to change the models uh, to actually get uh, decent results. Uh, the second one, the second thing we noticed uh, is performance, and performance is really critical. It's both on the training side, as well as on the on the usage side, for for training, like when we started, uh, training a model on a future corpus would take several days, uh, and that caused issues from the infrastructure perspective. Uh, it is also difficult to iterate on uh, because it takes so long. So we've done a lot of optimizations, a lot of improvements for our infrastructure for the project, and we managed to speed up things by 8x. So now, like we're at I think something like 16, 17 hours, which is a lot better. But we think we can do better. Uh, the same on the usage side, like we've actually seen some significant uh, compile time regressions uh, and we had to do lots of refactoring improvements uh, inside LLVM uh, to address those issues. Uh, the third aspect is that integrating LLVM frameworks into LLVM can actually be challenging. Uh, so in, on our side, we use TensorFlow and TensorFlow, as you may know, is a large project. It's non-trivial. It's comparable to LLVM. Um, and, and Toolchain vendors typically have special requirements, like we statically link our toolchain, uh, we use advanced optimization techniques like LTO, and doing that with TensorFlow, it can be, it can be tricky, we actually spend a lot of time uh, like starting out, like making improvements to the build system on their side, on our side, and this is something that we're still working on. Uh, but you can definitely tell when, when you start doing these things that uh, like those scenarios, those use cases, is not something that people thought of, thought of before. Uh, and so, like, like we've actually been working very closely with TensorFlow team uh, to, to address some of our requirements. And finally, and this is actually related to the previous one, uh, these ML frameworks also have non trivial dependencies. Uh, like, if you actually want to, like, include all the TensorFlow's dependencies, you're looking at, like, tens of different libraries. Uh, they also use uh, package management systems that are, that may not be Something that we are used to, for example, like TensorFlow is using PIP, uh, the Python's package manager for distributing dependencies, and integrating this into, again, LLVM. It has been challenging, uh, so this is also something that we've been working on. Uh, yeah, I can go next. So, I mean, we don't have time for me, actually, that much. Like, uh, the main thing that I wanted to draw attention to here is about maintainability. 
Uh, I think that because now we are you know, exposing features out of the compilation pipeline, there's a particular opportunity for deeper research, like for whoever's research minded into characterizing the, the box of this technology, right? Like, and they can actually do it on, on real projects like Chrome or Fuchsia or some of like that. Uh, but let's, let's move on, because I mean, uh, ask me after. Um, can I take over? Yeah, oh yeah, he can ask you, yeah, yes, yeah. Oh yeah, go for <laughs> it, sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Dibendu and uh, I work at Intel, so mainly I'm working on the deep learning uh, stack, but I also spend time with uh, machine learning approaches to deep learning. So this first slide is mainly on the performance uh, aspects where we are trying to see whether uh, from a high level uh, description of a data flow graph, uh, mainly in MLR form, whether we can predict certain uh, hardware characteristics like you know register pressure and uh, XP utilization. Mainly for the XP utilization, we're mainly looking at the vector uh, kind of you know vector register and those kind of occupancies uh, right now. So what we have done for this work is uh, we have uh, modeled uh, the MLR. And currently, we are just handling high-level MLR. Uh, the plan is maybe later down, we'll probably try to look at uh, more dialects and things like that. But this one is a high-level MLR of a data flow graph, and then we use some kind of a uh, uh, you know, machine learning technique to uh, get a model to predict these hardware characteristics. Currently, we are uh, looking at NLP-like models. We have, uh, you know, uh, kind of experimented with uh, con one d with uh, uh, MaxPool and things like that. But we can go into you know LSTMs or transformers or methods, and the plan is to use this to evaluate mainly optimization. Let's say something like deep plan or you know like loop unrolling and lining and things like that, uh, or search and op space like it happened in auto TBM. We are actually uh, in our work uh, mainly working to see how it will help in fusion of the data flow uh, operators uh, at, at high level uh, optimization point. And uh, this was actually part of the talk I did in the morning, and you can see uh, some of the details so if you want in a video or later of your data. So next slide, please. Yeah, the other work that we have done, and it's uh, you know a bit of uh, uh, last year's work, uh, it's a called a neural instruction combiner, where we are trying to see whether we can. Uh, do automated instruction combining uh, using some kind of uh, machine learning, and then uh, generate LLVM uh, code from this, uh, uh, you know, from this machine learning process. Um, so what we do is we take uh, the LLVM uh, code and we kind of tokenize and do similar stuff that we did in the earlier work uh, using NLP-like techniques. And uh, then we generate uh, the new LLVM. The problem that we saw with this uh, particular approach compared to a uh, performance or things like that is uh, it's difficult to generate LLVM back uh, from uh, from LLVM again. You know that's that's the challenging part, and also whether you get correctness out of these newly generated LLVM. Uh, so that's that's the main things. Uh, you know, these two part of the work, and then we can discuss later. I think I'll hand okay. over to the next speaker. We're running, running out of time. Yeah, perfect. Amir? Hey, uh, hi everyone. My name is Amir. So I work at the Huawei Canada. So the, the work I'll, I'll just quickly go over through is uh, MLGO Perf, uh, for which we, uh, here in Huawei Canada, we managed to, you know, um, um, accomplish in the past, past year with my colleagues. So we actually um, started with uh, the MLGO, which is uh, the ML guided optimization for in line for the code size and extended the project to tackle performance. So I'm not going to go through the, uh, the pros and cons of the functional lining. As you know, uh, there is a trade-off and it's a very fine line between the, the code size load and the, uh, the subsequent optimization we're going to get from having a, an intelligent new lining. Um, next slide, please. So what we do here is, uh, so we, we try to employ a two ML model approach for which the first one, which we call IRP curve, uh, you know, uh, trains and learns the, uh, the post inlining speed up of a function. And we can use that as uh, some sort of a reward generator for, for the second model, which, uh, you know, was in place for, for the original MLGO. And 
and we, uh, you know, we targeted to to focus on performance optimization. So every at every iteration of the training, we use the reward generated by IR to perf, and then we train the the, the second model. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we think this paradigm, as you see, we're going to have two ML models. The first one, which you can see on top, uh, you know, needs the characterization of the function, and it generates an output, which we'll then use on the on the second model as reward. So on the second model, uh, the RL model needs the characterization of the of its states by uh, you know uh, some sort of static features from the colleague, and the final action would be whether or not to align a call set. Uh, next slide, please. So by employing these two models together, uh, we, we managed to uh, you know outperform uh, LLVM optimization O3 on a spec by around 1.8 percent. Uh, at the same time, uh, and as a caveat, we have uh, around 17% code size loads with respect to O3 and also 23% with respect to the original MLGO project. Uh, I can go through uh, further details, uh, you know, after, uh, after uh, if anybody, anybody was interested. Thank you. That's perfect. That was even faster than expected. Who's up next? Andre. Uh, hello, I'm Andre I'm, uh, from Google as well. I've been working on uh, machine learning for uh, inverse throughput prediction. So a machine learning model that could serve as a more precise uh, drop-in replacement for LVM MCA or IACA or similar tools, and to be used as a cost model in uh, other optimizations. So uh, unlike other tools, uh, it's operating on uh, assembly-like code or typically actual assembly code and on basic blocks. And Produces numbers typically invest through good in cycle. Uh, I presented this part last year. What, where we moved since then is we verified that we have a state of the art in uh, machine learning modeling for uh, performance prediction for throughput prediction. It's a graph neuralent model end to end, very few parameters, very few feature engineering. If you're interested, there's a paper, or you can reach out to me. And we can talk about that. And it, it's an independent library, but it's using LLVM data structures, so it should be easy to integrate into LLVM uh, passes or use together, easy to use together with other LLVM tools. My current plan is just pushing this to GitHub. So if you open the paper, there's a, a GitHub URL which doesn't work. Uh, my goal for this week or early next week is to make it work. Um, yeah. I'm mainly interested in performance modeling. I'm also looking for applications for the, for the cost models. So if you have any, any use cases for it, ping me or email me and we can talk. And I'll let, uh, let the next speaker. Perfect. Thank you. Present. Aiden? Hi, I'm Aiden Grossman. I'm currently an undergraduate at UC Davis, and I worked on uh, ML RegAlloc. So ML RegAlloc is a machine learning heuristic for the wide range eviction problem. So the LLVM greedy register allocator will take a bunch of um, take a bunch of variables, try and assign them into registers, and then when inevitably some of them don't fit, it'll iteratively try and evict some of them, so that you can try and find the most optimal combination. So what we're doing is we're replacing the eviction heuristic, which is a handcrafted heuristic, with a machine learning model to try and extract some more performance out of it. So um, as mentioned previously, we're seeing like one to one and a half percent performance improvements when everything's working properly. So I worked on adding instruction-based features, particularly just a naive instruction embeddings to the model to try and see how adding more context about the problem could possibly help improve performance. And then that we're also currently experimenting with some graph-based features that are pretty similar. Uh, I didn't, with specifically just the naive instruction embeddings, didn't really see any um, new performance gains, but like we did see some pretty interesting results. Uh, so just using instruction embeddings and not any of the domain-specific features that we're shipping in upstream LLVM right now, we were able to see results that were comparable to the comparable to the cur current heuristic. There's a couple asterisks to that claim um, because of how we measured it, but so more investigation needed, but um, maybe. And then. Uh, uh, so I did a lot of experimentation using Chromium as a corpus for reinforcement learning because it's primarily applied um, to internal Google data center apps. And I was working on the open source side and we can't just, none of the Google data center apps are open source. So I was using Chromium as an open source um, project to train models on, um, exposed a couple new compiler and linker bugs just due to, due to how their build system was um, quite a bit different. And then 
We're currently working on upstreaming it in Chromium to try and get a performance improvement there and then um, further improve our own processes. Uh, so, I mean, we've seen that from that, like the model is somewhat adaptable to different code bases. And then we've also seen a couple different problems, particularly with our reward generation that we're um, working on fixing right now. And then, yeah, we're also, like I mentioned before, experimenting with graph-based features and different model architectures on the ML side to see what kind of performance we can figure out. So. Okay, perfect. Um, next we have Chris. Hey, uh, I'm Chris. I work at uh, Meta, I, I think. Um, so I've used, uh, <laughs> I won't check my phone. Uh, I've used LVM for a number of years. Uh, I'm actually not a developer, I'm just a happy user. Um, so uh, in LVM, uh, I used it as a, I think it makes fantastic uh, test bed for research. So my early research was doing like natural language processing to try and like figure out how to optimize code. Uh, now I'm looking at like graph models to try and answer the question of like how do we make machine learning think like a compiler. Um, in open source, uh, I'm the lead developer of uh, Compiler Gym, which is a framework which tries to bring together a bunch of like interdisciplinary ideas in order to get people to look at uh, compiler problems, because we think they make really interesting test cases for machine learning, and the impact is there if we can, uh, if we can achieve these wins. Um, and then at Meta, I've been working with uh, the product teams on how to actually productionize these ideas. So uh, specifically, I've been working with the compiler team that uh, builds the Facebook app and seeing if we can use machine learning to improve and make their app more efficient. Um, so since this is a, a developer meeting, I thought it would be just a, a good idea to come over a couple of things that I think LVM or more generally just compilers could do that would make it a little bit easier to do this kind of work. So the first is um, discoverability. So uh, there are lots and lots of decision points within compilers that would make very interesting tuning and machine learning problems. But actually finding where those are is uh, tricky. So a um, concrete example is uh, in a past life I was at DeepMind and I was looking at one particular optimization that was very important to them for the TPUs. Um, and they had this like 900 line long function with determined uh, whether or not a piece, of, a piece of code should be optimized using this pass. Um, and actually, if you look through this 900 line function, you see that there's two questions. There's, uh, can this optimization be applied legally? And then the second question is, should this optimization be applied in order to give it better performance? And the first question can't be answered with machine learning. That is the realm of compiler experts. But the second one is where the interesting optimization decisions can be made. And actually, just teasing those two apart was quite an effort, and that was just uh, through you know, asking lots of the questions to the people who wrote this pass. And that was one optimization pass. There are millions of lines of code in LVM. So I think discoverability is a big problem. Uh, the other one is modularity. So LVM has this nice modular design where in theory you can take all of the stages of the of compilation and like break them up. Um, but it doesn't always uh, deliver on this promise as well as we would like. So for example, like one of the problems in compiler gym is uh, pass ordering and pass selection, you know, nice big search base. We've found dozens of cases where if you take these passes, which in theory can be reordered and permuted in any combination you like, um, actually that can introduce subtle bugs like the compiler breaks, or much worse, it will generate a uh, broken binary. So I think there's a couple of opportunities for, uh, for interesting improvements there. And uh, I look forward to discussing it with the panel. Perfect. Right on time. And, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Venkat. I'm a PhD student from IIT Hyderabad. My area of interest is in the intersection of uh, ML and programs. Uh, specifically, I work in the intersection of uh, applying ML for compiler optimizations that are based on heuristics uh, in order to make them better. So as a part of this, uh, we developed a framework for, for uh, program embeddings of program representations called IRTV. So uh, basically, when we take a uh, machine learning application uh, on programs, we need to represent programs in a way that is amenable for learning. So especially, uh, we need to, in specific, we need to represent programs as some sort of numerical vectors. So here in this work, we try to uh, represent programs as uh, uh, embeddings analogous to that of uh, word -tivec or others in case of master language processing in order to make uh, the represents, uh, representation better and richer. So the hypothesis is very straightforward. The richer the representation is, better the performance is on the downstream class. So with that, uh, we try to get a richer representation of programs. Uh, so in this case, we try to make use of LLVM IR as the underlying structure of the program. So in that sense, we make it a uh, machine and language independent uh, representation. 
So again, the, such representation should generalize across applications, or rather, it should be application independent. Uh, specifically, they should be usable in different compiler optimization, software engineering tasks. So uh, we tried out a couple of uh, uh, couple of tasks in uh, in the, in the uh, published work. So uh, they are uh, device mapping, choosing an optimal device in case of a heterogeneous device environment and thread forcing application. Using a similar philosophy, uh, we applied uh, we model programs or uh, vectors rather uh, to study different compiler optimization tasks like uh, register allocation, where we propose an end-to-end -end framework integrated with LLVM uh, to uh, to do a register allocation uh, suggested by an RL model. Similarly, uh, we have uh, studied loop distribution to expose uh, better locality and parallelization. And phase ordering of optimization passes to optimize for size and time. And uh, for algorithm identification task, where uh, we take a program, big snippet, and see if uh, the snippet matches with a particular known algorithm. So some of these are open source, and uh, uh, please do check out this link if you are interested. Thank you. Looking forward for further discussions. Great. And I think one more. No. Most of us with the Okay, so then we're through with our presentations, which now means uh, we'll open the floor for questions and uh, comments and concerns. So we have two mics. Feel free to get up and, and head to them. And um, to, I mean, kick things up, what, what path did you have to uh, untangle the heuristic and the fusion? Fusion. So this was for TPUs. Yep. Uh, so a lot of operations can't be fused. Um, some operations can be fused, but it won't be profitable. And there's actually, it's kind of a soft barrier because some things could be fused, but, or at least the compiler thinks it could be fused, but actually causing this fusion would mean that later on you can't run it on some bit of hardware. So it's not that the compiler has all the information it needs. It's not, a solve, not necessarily an easily solvable problem. Um, but that was one example. I imagine there are lots of other passes with similar. No. That was actually, I was going to say, like, that's, that's exactly what we kept having to do all the time. Like, for both inlining and regalog, the, a good chunk of the time was actually disentangling, you know, what's correctness from what's heuristics. And it's not very obvious. And with loop and roll, like, uh, uh, both last year and this year, you right. Know, right? Like, I mean, yeah, we had to Google some of students that. looking right. at that and starting exactly there. That's exactly the, yeah. So, and I think it's useful from a maintainability perspective too. Not that I like the word that much, but I kind of do. But uh, so besides that, just clarifies like where is it that you know this is the holy of the holies? You cannot touch it. You know, like uh, you know, this better be you know hold right. So I mean, the correctness code is then easier to analyze by by hand versus like well, who cares here? You know, I mean, right. just, yeah. As, I mean, it, it just has benefit on its own. Okay, we have some, the first few questions. Matt, you want to go ahead? I, I think you were alluding to it, but was the point that you were trying to use machine learning to just like rewrite the pass pipeline? Okay. Right. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. But it was just a clarification? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. yeah. All right. Second question. So taking the inline error as, as an example, um, how much of the gains you think are due to um, learning threshold um, as opposed to um, actually like understanding um, the code in the functions. Uh, like for example, if you just tune the thresholds, like what percentage of the gains yeah. do you think you would get? So we didn't, so just to clarify, like we're not learning thresholds, right? Like, you know, like we got it out. I mean, on the ML side, there's no threshold twizzling. We are feeding a bunch of features and decisions come out. But coming back to the question about threshold twizzling, right? So very early on, like we, we played with, uh, uh, or with Vizier, okay, like you know what that is, but I don't know if it's open. Does Vizier say anything to anyone? Okay, then no. It's basically like a- uh, It's a open source, so, so, so. It is open source, okay. Yeah, okay. So basically it's something like a, a Bayesian optimization the hyperparameter tuning stuff. Right. So you can tell it to, hey, you know, like uh, we gave it a bunch of binaries and just kind of like uh, try to find the best threshold. So actually tuning the existing thresholds. And the results are like, I mean, it kind of gave us an idea of headroom, but you know, like since then I think that what we're doing right now, uh, 
beats that, actually. The other thing is that what we're doing right now is one model that works well for a category of software. While with thresholds, it was definitely not the case. <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? Yes. OK. And I guess that also ties into like overfitting. Like, so uh, the earlier, actually, I was talking to someone about overfitting. So uh, I don't know. So this goes into the, the, the part of the, the, the thing that I wanted to draw attention to, which is like there's opportunities for deep investigation into what actually is happening there, right? That we, we intentionally didn't do. We, we, we are doing shallow, broad, you know, like whatever we need to actually make something go in production, right? The depth thing is something that we're hoping to get interest from, from researchers and so on. But coming back to your question about overfitting, like, you know what, if it overfits to all data center apps at Google, that's great. I mean, not, not for Google, like, you know, I'm trying to say so, man, that came out, but I mean, like, uh, <laughs> Like what I'm trying to say is that if it works for a large category of software, there is like more or less canonical. So let's say the thing that works for Chrome doesn't work well for, uh, for let's say Meta or like you know like uh, Google. That's fine, right? Because I mean these are large enough things that can have their own corpora and uh, you know tool chains and blah blah. So if the answer is oh, but it overfits, that's fine, right? Like I mean if you can live with that for like a, a year or something and it does well, uh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the doc. There's a lot of unknown unknowns. So this is yeah. just something, well, like, I think there's still a lot to be discovered. This is something we've encountered when we started. So like in Fuchsia, we, we target both x86 and x86-64 and AR-64. So initially, like, we weren't sure, like, would it be better to have model trained separately for each architecture, or would it be better to actually have combined model uh, that like, is trained on corpus that targets both? And our intuition was that, well, having the, the hyper-optimized model for each architecture is going to be better. So we actually tried it out, and it turns out in the end, the combined corpus outperformed the individual ones, which is not the result we were expecting. Let's see. Um, Next question. So uh, I guess I, I'm pretty new to LLVM, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's like already a concerted kind of effort to do this, or if it's mostly individuals uh, doing experiments uh, separately, and also whether there are any yeah, shared data sets that people are kind of uh, experimenting, uh, experimenting against. That's a good question. Um, let me come backwards from the shared data set. Well, the answer is no. Uh, I mean, I think you, you guys have some shared data sets, right? That's why we built Compilgen, is right. to try and make this tool so that you can get, so like we ship data, depends on what you mean by data sets, but we try and give you everything you need in order to do machine learning research. So if you want a few million programs, you can get that, or if you want run times, or if you want, say, like program representations, like a graph or a text of the IR, or um, we try and provide everything out of the box for you to do that kind of thing. On, on our side, the way we looked at it was that we care about um, data set rep representativeness for what we actually have, right? So uh, it, I, I, it's just like a different approach, right? So I mean, like our goal was nudging production. So we have. Uh, and this is not like we versus like or anything like this. It's more like there's like depends on what you want to do, right? So if you want to do like what, what Chris was saying, then you know like uh, right there, right? You have everything you need. Uh, our focus is product, uh, uh, production workloads. So then we have tools to extract your own corpus from whatever matters to you, uh, and then do whatever you want there, right? Uh, so and similarly, like we have what you need in LLVM to. Um, you know, like uh, if you extract features that matter to you for a particular pass that matters to you or for whatever optimization, and uh, you know, like then you can hook up uh, machine learning models and ingest them and ship that compiler, right? Uh, so I suppose there's like a whole, you know, like you can you can start from somewhere, explore, and then like when you when you make up your mind, uh, land. Th does that answer your question? Yep. Thank okay. you. Yep. Well, let's let's keep on that topic. So I mean, the question is what kind of things do we currently have in the community in LLVM to you know, help people, you people, or people that want to get started with this? And I mean, Aiden, you, you kind of you know, were not that long ago a person that got started with this <laughs> in the LLVM community, so maybe that's yeah. one for you. So um, I mean, it was getting started with specifically the MLGO infrastructure. So there was a, there was a pretty well-written inlining demo using Fuchsia as a corpus. Um, so like having good documentation is definitely helpful. Like I'm working on one right now for the Regalic case too. Um, so like, yeah, good documentation is definitely helpful. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, because it definitely just took a lot of time to
figure out a lot of the intricacies in a lot of the areas that we were working in. Like the Red Jallet case didn't have a demo and I had to like fix code in order to get things working. So um, yeah, like lowering the barrier to entry to, would, it's a, like the bar barrier to entry has definitely been lowered, but it's like for some of the things it could definitely go down. Yeah, and we also like, uh, you're also at the, the time when we're trying to move away from TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite yeah. and like, you know, like, <laughs> Hitting yes, so I mean, yeah, the barrier to entry is a bit accept, like kind of high, but I think compiler gym is kind of like can like, increase, right? And, and on resources and other things that we have, like you're organizing, uh, what? Oh, uh, there's a subgroup in LLVM called um, well, machine learning added optimization LLVM. Uh, it meets every every first Friday of the month, give or take. I mean, if there's no agenda, let's not waste time. Uh, so that, that's, uh, I mean, there's a label in uh, Discourse. Uh, this, which one is it? Discourse, Discord. Discourse, right? The, the mailing one. list one. The one, <laughs> the one that's not the chat, okay. So, um, yeah, there's an MLGO label there. You can ask questions or like uh, look at things. There's, uh, right. there's a documentation that could be improved. <laughs> okay, how did you get started? Like, how did you kind of end up doing any of this? Uh, so I just started working through the demos that were available and then um, just started mostly just reading code that was relevant to what I was working on, so. <laughs> yeah, spoken like a true programmer, I like it. Okay, we have a question over there. Yeah, hi. Um, for the folks up on stage that have productionized some of these techniques, can you talk a little bit about return on investment? So I'm assuming you retrain the models, training has costs in terms of kilowatt hours, not just time or labor. I mean, so, so maintenance costs are also factored in at some point, but just, do you get wins? I mean, it's expensive to train these multi-billion parameter models, I'm assuming, no, on these large corpses. They're not that big, actually. So, yeah, but, but so, uh, I, I, let me start with the, the Google yeah, 3 thing. So, the register, so, okay, first of all, uh, it, um, we have to tease apart the upfront investment where like, you know, like Yundi and I were like working on register allocation and there was a lot of like some cost that, that is disproportionately high compared to next time we do something like this. So if I were to say, let's not consider that, right? I mean, Yundi, training is like what, like a day or like what? Uh, yeah, so the training is taking up, so uh, we have like a tiny uh, feed forward the neural net, net, network to make the, de the decision to avoid the Fitting stuff, so we only need like one GPU for uh, training. Mm -hmm. uh, so technically, if you do train, if you have a uh, beefy like uh, uh, 128 core machine, you could uh, do all the training uh, on your one machine by about uh, one or two days. And the model that we are talking about is the one that we shipped in April, and we haven't changed since. Like it does just fine. So I mean. So what about, like, you, you guys train more? Uh, no, actually, the model we are shipping right now, we've trained last year. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So about a year ago, and we are actually now thinking about doing another one. So, like, the way I see this is, like, like there's, like, a spectrum, right? Like, on, on one hand, you have, like, the fixed heuristics we have in LVM, and on the other side of the spectrum, like, you have, like, PGO, where, like, you, you instrument the code you're going to ship, and then you use, uh, like, the counters, like, the profile that you've collected. Uh, but PGO is really expensive, and I would say, like, the, the learn models for your experience are somewhere in between. Uh, well, they are more tailored towards your code base, your corpus that you've used, but they seem to be generalizing pretty well, but they also don't need to be trained as often. But they perform, in our experience, better than the heuristics there are in LVM. I mean, in terms of return on investment, it's a really hard one because like, we're still at a mode where we are learning a lot of things, so there's still a lot of investment in actually like, like trying out a lot of like exploring different paths, like running into different dead ends, uh, I feel like a year, two years, three years from now, we might know better. So if somebody would come back then, we can tell you like, well, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. If you come in now, like you will probably have to explore some of these things, find out some of these things yourself. Uh, but we still hope that it's going to be interesting enough that we can uh, you know, like encourage more of you to actually start doing this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, as you said, sorry, I didn't catch your name, the R&D that is implicit in any of these projects could be discounted, so I agree with you. Yeah. So like, I was more so interested in the production. Yeah. Oh, me <laughs> okay. I was yeah, more interested in the, in the production cost, like, hey, the retraining, but it turns out you oh, get no we retraining. Oh, we don't, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So 
Exactly. It's not something that you need to do periodically. And I'll, I'll, I'll again, signal boost that whole thing that I kind of care about. Like, there's a lot of in-depth research to be done. So the empirical evidence is that you don't have to do it too often. But I'm, it's, in, it's an interesting question. So, okay, so when then, right? With manual heuristics, the answer is like, I don't know, like, really, right? With this, because the compiler becomes a bit translucent, you know, like there's data coming out of it anyway for training. We could actually farm that and understand like, hey, you know, time has come because some numerical distribution of some features has diverged from like whatever, whatever that research will reveal, right? So, but it's definitely not something that you have to do frequently. Like, uh, and it, they're, not big, they're not large models either. <laughs> yeah, that's surprising too, but anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, quick question because we are out of time. Oh, okay. So, uh, how sensitive are these models to changes in uh, like the input IR or if uh, you know, the IR changes or some algorithm in say Clang or you know, whatever the front end compilers is, how they change? So, I mean, both the size and the, the performance one, the Regalock one, I mean, you know, like, like we were saying, like we shipped uh, one of them in April. I mean, people were busy since then, both in the LLVM community. And we at Google ingest the compiler very, like, you know, weekly, okay? So we all know what happened in, you know, like, whatever the, I mean, you know, LLVM, people work. Uh, so did our engineers in search. Uh, I'm sure Fuchsia wasn't sitting on their hands either. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah. there is a dependency that, you know, uh, you're closely aware of what's happening in the LLVM side when you're also working on the, you know, on these tools. No, what I'm saying is that we didn't have to retrain it. So, I mean, to answer your question, they're pretty resilient. Like, I mean, you know, clang changes, like, you know, LLVM changes happen. Uh, code base, like, you know, target code base ch changes happen, right? Uh, across a number of kinds of code, code bases, we've seen this, and the models are pretty resilient. So, I would say they seem to be resilient. <laughs> like, okay. months and we, months. Thank you. I think we might be out of time. Are we out of time? Oh, we have five more minutes. Okay, oh, here we go. Okay. Five more minutes, I'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, I imagine some of these uh, networks have large enough feature vectors for some specific optimization. So, is there a way to understand what the network has learned? Uh, and can we like summarize some of that uh, and just put it back into heuristics? Because I imagine deploying and actually productizing this is hard. And when you get something like 1%, maybe there's like two line change that will give me like 75% of the 1%. And I'm happy with that. Right? Yeah. Is there, yeah. uh, like I'm not an ML guy, so maybe there are like easy ways to figure out what the network's actually learned. Uh, any ML people? I mean, uh, decision trees are very nice machine learning methods because the output looks exactly like a heuristic. It's a set of if else's. So if you have, if you are using a bunch of features to describe your program and you feed it in and you train a machine, machine sorry, train a decision tree on your training set, then you can just take that output hard code of this, your C++, your new heuristic. But I don't think that, I think we should aim a bit higher. Like I, I think that uh, interpretability of the model is, is a very nice thing to have, but not if it limits our ability to build better models. And I actually think that flattening down code to a list of numbers that tries to you know, aggregate over some counters in the IR. We kind of know that you can, ask, you can ask very simple questions of models that are trained on that kind of representation, and we know that they don't actually think like compilers. Like, they can't solve data flow, for example. So we lose all this nice context that we would have if we were to learn over a richer representation that captures more of the IR, which I th is where I personally think the interesting research is to be done. And there's also the aspect of figuring out exactly what features to have for a particular, so it's like the feature engineering for the pass. Are there like good guidelines on like what is stable, what is not, and uh, what time? I mean, for, for certain passes like register allocation, there's like, you know, you'd better represent your live range information somehow, right? Like, I mean, nothing will pop that out for you, right? So. Uh, I think the guidance is the same that we'd use, like, you know, it's our domain expertise as compiler engineers, right? Like, well, what makes sense, what, what, what is the kind of information that makes sense to, to expose or to highlight, right? And I think that it can be used in, you know, complementing or whichever way with, like, more ambiental information like IR, embeddings, and whatever, but it, it, it's still a compiler field, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, we are not an ML person either, like, uh, you know, we use our expertise to figure that out. So if I can add uh, wait, wait. Add to this. Kim, like we have two people. Matt, just start. 
follow, so like my, my comment on that is we do have a lot of completely randomly arbitrarily decided thresholds scattered throughout the compiler that if we got some kind of like training result on, it would be really easy, like low maintenance cost to just like get some numbers out of those and make those into new defaults. All right. So yeah, we have a Venkata. Yeah. So if I can add, add on to uh, what she said, uh, so uh, another view is that to have some sort of embeddings where we don't have uh, specific features defined. So, uh, yeah, so this also seems to work fine. Uh, that uh, solves the problem of feature engineering and based on what we observed across uh, applications, uh, without engineering specific features, we are able to train on different, uh, achieve similar performance on different tasks too. So this is another school of ta uh, thought is what I think. Same. Okay, now we are running out of time. Yeah. So we're going to stop it here. Okay. And then. Yeah, we're, we're out of time. Uh, next question to begin. But thanks yeah. for attending the let's, panel. Let's thank all the panelists and uh, <laughs> reach out to them if, you, if you're interested.